Welcome to Tales from the Jar Side, the video series. Don't feel like reading my weekly newsletter? That's fine. I'll be happy to read it to you, along with giving you other links and discussions and extra commentary. Think of this as the director's cut of the newsletter. My name is Ken Cousin. I'm your host. Let's dive right in. So the title this week is Tales from the Jar Side, Gradle Parallel Tests, that's the technical content this week, Working at a Nuke Plant, Song Lyrics Revisited, and Amusing Tweets and Toots. The subtitle is A Dolphin Dad Going, Your Mom and I Met in School, Dolphin Mom Wincing, Please Don't, and Dolphin Dad then responding, and we just clicked. Oops, didn't get my instant rim shot ready to go ahead of time here. There you go. Dolphins click at each other. I, you know, it's not great, but I mean, how often are they? Are these great? Welcome, fellow jarheads, to Tales from the Jar Side, the Cousin IT newsletter for the week of March 19th through 26th, 2023. This week I taught the second week of my Spring and Spring Boot in Three Weeks course on the O'Reilly Learning Platform and a Key Gradle Concepts course as a no-fluff, just-stuff virtual workshop. Regular readers of and listeners to and, of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as Jarheads and are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. If you wish to become a Jarhead, please subscribe either using the button on the newsletter or, of course, using the subscription on the Tales from the Jar side YouTube channel. So, there that. There's the Tales from the Jar side YouTube channel. And, hey, what a surprise. I'm subscribed. <laughs> I have a separate channel for this. So, that's on my personal account. So, I am subscribed. Hey, got to have somebody. Okay, starting with Gradle Parallel Tests. Again, to make this into a bit of a story, for several years, I taught the online Introduction to the Gradle Build Tool course offered by Gradle Incorporated. The class was offered every other month. I did that from roughly, I don't know, 2017 or 18 until roughly sometime last year, 2022. I didn't always follow the materials as given, which was a subject of some discontent, I think, but the materials needed to be updated. I had other demos I wanted to do, and the reviews were always good, so they didn't bother me. Eventually, they hired somebody to actually revise the materials, which I thought was a good idea, but it turned out that person was also hired to bring the courses in-house and teach them themselves. I was a contractor for Gradle, and, you know, good for them. That's fine. They set up an entire series of offerings. In fact, I have a, a link here to see it, but it's easier if I just go to gradle.org. That's the open source tool. Let me cut down the magnification on that for a moment. If you go under training, training tab at the top, there's register now or training journey. And if you go to training journey, that's gradle.org slash courses. You can see here. And they have a whole series of I would say one day, but really half day courses available, including introduction, different from the one I taught, but similar. And then ones for JVM builds and Android and on the build cache and a few more things that are all coming later. So you're welcome. They're all free. I hope you, if you take them, good for you. I, I think that's fine. Um, but I, I had a whole bunch of demos that I do in my regular Gradle training, as well as when I do no fluff, just stuff presentations or virtual workshops on it. And I thought I'd record one because I don't want to lose that information. I don't want to forget how I went about doing it. And sometimes it takes a little prep. This week I taught a, an introduction to Gradle course. So it was on my mind. So I took one of them, which basically has this somewhat clickbaity title, speed up your tests using one line in Gradle. At any rate, I made a video about it. And it, it really is literally true. You Basically, what this is about is making your JUnit tests run in parallel using the, the property called max parallel forks inside the test block in your Gradle build file. All you have to do is to set it to something other than one, and then you are trying to run tests concurrently. 
of course, the tests have to be independent, and but tests usually are. That's usually something you can try. And I use this all the time, and it's very interesting. So if you're interested, take a look at the video. Uh, that's supposed to be my <laughs> surprise face. Yeah, I, I don't know. I keep trying to make these little, what do they call it, thumbnails for the videos, and I'm not sure this is turning out really well on all that, but let me know what you think. Uh, I did the the code in both the Groovy DSL and the Kotlin DSL in case you're interested. So if you are a Gradle person or interested in becoming a Gradle person, feel free to take a look. Next section, <clears throat> Peach Bottoms Up. <laughs> okay, speaking of bad puns. When I was in college and dinosaurs roamed the earth, I spent three summers, the summers after my freshman Junior, uh, sophomore and junior years as a low paid, what they called a co-op actually at Peach Bottom Atomic Power Station, which is a nuclear power plant in Delta, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pico, Philadelphia Electric Company at the time had this co-op program with several local universities, one of which I believe was Drexel in Philadelphia. And students would come out there and work for like six months at a time. And I, my summer job was kind of uh, related to that. So I didn't live there. I was able to drive, but it was a, I don't know, 40, 45 minute drive each day. So it was a little annoying. At any rate, here's Peach Bottom as the, this is the Wikipedia page for it. It's a nuclear power plant for those who care about such things. It's a boiling water plant located roughly 50 miles southeast of Harrisburg in Peach Bottom Township, York County, Pennsylvania. And I lived in York. So here's a little map they even have here on the Wikipedia page. And if I click on that, I have to zoom in, obviously. But you can see there's York, there's Lancaster. Up here is Harrisburg. That's where Three Mile Island is, you know. But at any rate, there's York and Peach Bottoms down here. Down here is Baltimore, Wilmington, Philadelphia, you know, the, the regular what they call Northeast Corridor, if you're interested. So at any rate, I spent three summers there in different engineering groups. I got the job because like most kids, I didn't, I knew somebody who knew somebody, or rather my father knew somebody who knew the plant manager, as it turned out, who even more coincidentally lived down the street from me. Now I was ending my freshman year at MIT and my plan was to major in nuclear engineering, though my plan was to study fusion rather than fission. And there's all sorts of reasons why that actually didn't happen. But I'll, it's not, that's beyond the scope of today's newsletter. At any rate, I met with the guy. He was very nice and uh, did a little interview. And, and I'd like to think, as I say, my, I would like to believe my credentials. And I did a good interview. That got me the job. But if I'm really honest, I doubt there was a lot of competition. You see, that job started in the summer of 1980. And a year earlier, in March of 1979, that's when the accident at Three Mile Island occurred. And that was fresh in everybody's mind less than a year later, of course. Three Mile Island is near Harrisburg. I have a link here to the Wikipedia page on that. Now, I honestly have to admit, I hadn't thought about that accident for years, you know, and or any of this. But... I stumbled across this very interesting video on YouTube, or maybe I should say more properly, YouTube's algorithm suggested it, and I like the, the, um, the creator, uh, about what really happened at Three Mile Island. So it turns out that while I knew some of the basics, Three Mile Island's a very different type of reactor than the Peach Bottom station that I worked at. I worked at a boiling water reactor where there was only a single primary loop. So water would go through the core and turn to steam and then steam would drive the turbine, which generated the electricity and then get compressed back to water and back through the loop again. Three Mile Island was what they called a pressurized water reactor. There were two loops. The main loop was under high pressure and never turned to steam. There'd be a heat exchanger to a secondary loop that would boil the water and drive the turbines and make money for the company and all of that. Very different type of system. The downside to the boiling water reactor is that you had radioactive water all through the main loop and therefore you always had to be very careful not to step in a puddle or something like that because it's not that any of it was seriously dangerous. I mean, not anywhere we were. 
it's that you'd get this garbage on your clothes and then they take your clothes you see that always very humiliating to have to go home in a paper suit as they say i did get one pair of pants they gave me for working there and i loved it they were the most comfortable pants i'd ever worn and i somehow got a tiny spot on one leg that set off the little dosimeter as i was walking out now it was still really really low was, i mean honestly there was no danger at all but it's a highly regulated industry, and if you set off the alarm, somebody has to do something. So they tried the trick where you take masking tape and try to take the threads off that were the problem, and that didn't work, so they had to take my pants and then wash them and do whatever, and I was hopefully going to get them back. So I had to go home in a paper suit and everybody laughing at me, you know. But what ultimately happened is a couple days later, I got the pants back, and that leg had been sliced off at the knee. Like, oh, great. You know, my only option was to cut off the other leg and wear them as a pair of shorts or something, but I gave up. At any rate. So this video was very, very good, explaining what happened at Three Mile Island. And the the um, issues are there. I, I It's such so tempting to get into all that stuff in detail, but I'll just recommend you watch the video and take a look. I, I got lost in the Wikipedia pages and other stuff, just really digging into all this. But I'll just say my first summer at Peach Bottom was pretty uneventful. I made the normal mistakes a kid makes my age. And the first time you walk into the control room, because they have this giant control room for both running plants. And as was typical at the time, one station was down for maintenance while the other one was cranking out the megawatts. You know, they'd, it, the maintenance cycle would be a few months. And it was like every 18 months, you'd have to take one station down and hopefully you'd have the other one running if they ever were both running at the same time which happened i mean there's an overlap but boy did they crank out money that way but in general one was down while the other was up and what happens in a control room is there are you know banks of lights everywhere and alarms that go off whenever anything changes in the plant now at the time again one of the stations was down so I happened to walk in and almost as soon as I walked in, an alarm went off and I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? Or what's going on? What's wrong? And the guy who was escorting me started laughing because I didn't know. Again, in a maintenance routine, there's people working on systems all over the plant and the system is down, but it still sets off the alarms. So as long as the operator who's standing there in the control room knows that this is coming, they know what people are doing, then it's all routine. It's not a surprise. The operator goes over, hits a big red button and turns off the alarm. So it was funny to watch me flinch, but it was nothing. I mean, if, if a whole bunch of alarms had gone off on the running plant, that might've mattered, the running station. And that happens when you get what they call a scram, when, when something goes wrong and they shut down the plant. Uh, even though I didn't put it in the newsletter, one quick story about that, maybe I'll include it in a, in a later newsletter. One of the guys in the testing group was being an idiot and wasn't telling the operator what he was doing. And he was trying to reach some valve that he was going to test. And he managed to reach it, but he had to climb up to do it. Well, when he was done, he jumped down onto this enclosed case and alarms went off everywhere. And the operator didn't know anybody was there. So he had no idea what was happening, wound up scramming the whole reactor, everything shut down, and it takes a long time to clear everything and make sure everything's okay and bring it back up again. So it was really bad. And what turns out what, what that box was that he jumped onto was an earthquake monitor. <laughs> so he jumped on an earthquake monitor, which suddenly thought there was this massive earthquake and, oh no, we need to shut down immediately. And the operator didn't know what was going on and therefore couldn't stop it. And from then on, that, that employee had the nickname Boots, and that's what everybody called him for, for then on. That, that's how I found out about the story, actually. At any rate, moving on. So the second summer I was there, I had a roommate at MIT who lived in the Baltimore area, and he asked if he could get a job there too. And I was a little nervous because, I, frankly, I thought he was more qualified than I was. But what the heck, I, I asked if they had a position for him as well, and he used to join me. And Peach Bottom was roughly halfway between the two of us, so that was pretty good. 
Now, of course, we were, we were kids, you know, we were 18, 19 years old and in engineering. So what we used to do is go hang out with the operators when we weren't busy. And the operators were really good guys. They were down to earth and they were all guys. I mean, I'm using, you know, all the attendant sexual sexism and whatever else you might expect among blue collar employees back 40 years ago. You know, that's probably not surprising. But at any rate, they were really nice people, even though they were colorful, I guess you'd say. And we would go and hang out with the operator and the two of us would ask him, you know, we'd try to figure out how we could melt the place down. <laughs> because of course we did. And they would be very indulgent and kind of laughing at us. We said, well, what if we close this valve and this one over here? And the operator would go, okay, well, then I do this, 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 and this. Well, how about if this one failed? You know, what would you do then? Oh, well, then you do that, 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 and that. And of course, they'd have these exercises every year or so, you know, that would come in and run by the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. And I got to be in an exercise once. I was a, a victim of radiation or something. They had to carry me out on a stretcher and all that stuff. And I got a great T-shirt out of it. I just, it's just gone. It's, I wish I still had that T-shirt any rate, the operators were fantastic at this. They would always find some way to handle it. And in fact, the biggest lesson I learned in three summers there was that all you need is one operator who knows what they're doing and you can't melt the place down. You can't. I mean, the whole structure, the entire system, the entire design is, that's its primary goal is to prevent that from happening. So you you really have to make a huge number of failures for a problem to happen to that level. Uh, there's two goals. See, there's only two things you have to do in order to shut the place down. One is to drive all the control rods into the reactor, what they call a scram. And the other is to get rid of the waste heat. So the, the, cause the reactor doesn't completely just, yeah, the reaction stop, but it's still really hot. You got to get rid of all that heat because the heat without water to re remove it, would melt the core and that's where you get your meltdown. You can't get an explosion really. That's very difficult. To do. Although the people at Chernobyl managed it. But at any rate, not in American reactors with our regulations, it just wouldn't wouldn't going to happen. Um but all you needed was a way to remove that heat and that means you need a way to get water into the core and I should have said in the newsletter, you also kind of need uh, some power, some at all as a way to keep that water pumping, you know, to, to drive the pumps to make sure the water is removing the heat and not just sitting there waiting for it to boil. So there are tons of ways to do that, system after system after system and, and all these automatic backups and, and things that would kick in. Any rate, they even included a valve the operator joked and it used to call the balls to the walls valve. If everything else goes wrong, you had this major valve you could open that would let river water directly into the core, right from the Susquehanna. Not coming back out again, it would still circulate somehow, but you know, just you could get water there somehow, you'd be okay. They called that the fish in the reactor solution there. So with all that, what happened at Three Mile Island? Now, again, I don't want to get into the details because it gets very complicated. But the bottom line is that they had some faulty readings from some sensors and the operators were no longer able to trust what they were seeing. So things were happening that looked contradictory because some sensors were telling them one thing and some sensors were telling them another. And it took a long time for them to work out what was actually happening in the core and by then there'd been melting and problems and everything but even with all that the systems did what they said they were going to do what they what they were designed to do there were no significant releases of any kind there were some minor venting and that is what triggered the massive political uh not political the press release problem the, the company that owned three mile island handled the press absolutely horribly not only did they not know what was going on, they continually tried to minimize it and even would put out contradictory information. And what eventually happened, actually what happened remarkably quickly is people stopped believing them. They lost, everybody stopped trusting them. So that was the real issue. The issue was the operators couldn't trust their instruments and the people no longer, especially the press, no longer trusted the company in any of their statements. And that was a disaster. And therefore, they even had this substantial evacuation for safety 
of pregnant women and preschool children or whatever, which was totally unnecessary, but better safe than sorry or whatever. But nobody believed them. And therefore, you had a problem. Incidentally, it was, I, again, I didn't put it in the newsletter, but the movie The China Syndrome about a nuclear disaster opened like two weeks before Three Mile Island disaster. I mean, the coincidences were amazing. It was just such a great boon for the movie, of course. But that didn't help the situation either. Now, the disaster in Fukushima in Japan, and I have a link to that as well, was largely due to two major problems. One was they had a 9.1 level earthquake, the biggest earthquake that that area had ever experienced under sea. And that already shook everything up really badly. And the real problem was it was followed by a tidal wave that had 45 to 50 foot waves that just did massive destruction. Now, they, the earthquake caused the reactor to shut down immediately, not a surprise. The problem was the tidal wave took the backup generators, the diesel generators that were powering the pumps to keep water circulating, and put them underwater, and they couldn't handle that. They shorted out. It was just gone. At Peach Bottom, we had the separate diesel generators a couple miles away, and then we had uh, these giant buildings in concrete bunkers that were full of batteries, I mean, like car batteries, just all wired together in series that could keep powering those pumps for hours and hours. I don't know what they had at Fukushima, but whatever they had, the damage was so widespread that they couldn't, they just had no way to keep power going there. And eventually the water boiled and they got a lot of damage. But even there, when you look at the number of, quote, deaths attributable to the accident, as opposed to deaths attributable to the earthquake and the, uh, the tidal wave, they say it's zero. You know, they, even with the statistical studies since then, the systems did what they were designed to do. It, I'm not saying it wasn't a disaster. It was, and it was very dangerous, and they did have to evacuate people out of safety, but it still worked. I mean, this was in massive contrast to the chaos at Chernobyl. If you ever saw the HBO series, which gets some things very right and some things very, very wrong, the idea that radiation poisoning is contagious is just ludicrous. and they leaned into it. It was terrible that uh, they did that, which was bizarre given how many things they got right. But I mean, in the, in the U.S., reactors have a reactor containment themselves, and then they have what they call primary containment, the building they're in, and then they have secondary containment, like three, four feet of concrete or steel surrounding it. So even if something really goes wrong, you've got at least two layers and maybe three if you count the reactor itself before you get anything released. In in Chernobyl, they only had primary containment, maybe, and they thought it was okay. And there's a whole bunch of problems. It really, as I say here, it was a massive combination of incompetence, denial, and design flaws. And you could take a look at the HBO series if you're interested. They, they do have a, that same YouTube channel as a video about some of it, and the guy actually went and visited and everything. If you're interested gets kind of depressing after a while. But I, I may have opinions about that later, but I'm not going to get into it now. What I mostly learned in my three summers there, you know, once you get used to it, you don't even really think about it that much anymore, is that I learned that I was terrible at mechanical work. You know, that sort of blue collar work is, I mean, I have nothing against it. In fact, I admire people who can do it. I've just never been any good at that, which I guess I could have told them coming in. <laughs> But it, again, it was a summer job and it worked out for me and, and the people were very nice. I had a good time with them. I was also glad though that I was leaving. I mean, again, it's just not my natural strengths. It wasn't really something I was good at. Uh, during Three Mile Island, for the record, you saw I, on that map, I, I actually was relatively close to Harrisburg. I lived in what they called the 12 mile radius from the plant because they, they divided these things into radiuses you know, to see whether you had to evacuate or anything. And what mostly happened for us is we got three days off of school and didn't have to make them up. So I was, I thought, hey, that was fine. Uh, ironically, also around the same time, about a month earlier, the Bee Gees released their song Tragedy and the radio kept playing that over and over again, you know, for obvious reasons. Okay, more about that than I want to get into, but let's move on. 
Uh, this section was called Song Lyrics Revisited. It's a little thing I do in the newsletter every once in a long while is I'll listen to an old song thrown up on my streaming service and hear those words in with a very different experience than I heard them as a kid. And this time it turned out to be that old classic, you know, Don't Pull Your Love by Hamilton, Joe Frank and Reynolds. Again, the, the emphasis on the need for an Oxford comma there. That's three guys, Hamilton, Joe Frank, and Reynolds. And for the first time, I actually kind of listened to the words, and they are not good. The, whoever the singer is singing to should run, not walk anywhere away from this guy. So, you know, haven't I been good to you? What about that brand new ring? Doesn't that mean love to you? Doesn't that mean anything? I'm already going, uh-oh. If I threw away my pride and I got down on my knees, would you make me beg you pretty please? And it's like, oh my God. Look, if she, you proposed and she said no, I mean, that's the implication here. Let, give it up. You know, you're only embarrassing yourself at this point. That's not going to make her change her mind. The chorus goes, you know, don't pull your love out on me, baby. If you do that, I think that maybe I'll lay me down, cry for a hundred years. Oh boy. Don't pull your love out on my honey. Take my heart, my soul, my money, but don't leave me drowning in my tears. It's like, um, that's, I'm worried that this guy, that's not even metaphorical for this guy too. I mean, he's back to begging. It's kind of pathetic. But the verse that jumps out when you listen to it again is an early one. It says, you'd say you're going to leave, going to take that big white bird, going to fly right out of here without a single word but you know you'll break my heart when I watch you close that door because I know I won't see you anymore. And it's like, wait a minute. she's feel Her feeling is she's got to get on a plane to get away from you? And why are you saying she didn't say a word when she just told you she's going to leave? Or did she not tell you you overheard her tell a real friend or something that she's got to run? This is not good. <laughs> this is seriously bad. And at the end, he goes, there's so much I want to do. I've got enough love for two. Uh, no, you don't. And I'll never use it, girl, if I don't have you. It's like, you don't have enough for two if one of them doesn't want to be there. Let's just be clear about that. And never is a long time. Somebody like that, that's Romeo falling in and out of love, falls out of love with Rosalind and in love with Juliet, you know, sure. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy was head over heels for the next girl who accidentally acts friendly to him. Every woman knows what that's like. Uh, after all, the other hit by the same group, band, was uh, Fallen in Love, of course. And this was done after Reynolds left the group. There's an interesting Wikipedia page on the band and how it went through various evolutions. But so be it. What I had no idea about when I started looking into this is Glenn Campbell, of all people, country singer Glenn Campbell, slash pop, paired that song with Then You Can Tell Me Goodbye into a medley. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that, which is at least kind of realistic. Okay, if you're leaving, then you can tell me goodbye. Fine. At, at least somebody who listen. That medley apparently is on the same album as Rhinestone Cowboy, which was a huge hit for him. They called it a comeback hit, even though he'd never really gone away. And from what I gather, though, did reasonably well in the U.S., it actually hit number two on the country charts in Canada. I mean, the 70s were strange. Now, I get it. If you're under 35 or maybe 40 or even older, I have no idea. You, you may not have any idea what, what I'm talking about, what these songs are, these people or anything. If you're going to give me a good eye roll and a heavy sigh and say, OK, Boomer, I'm fine with that. Uh, now, kindly get off my lawn or I'll cry for a hundred years. No, I can't even say that with a straight face. Okay, let's get to our tweets and toots. This was really funny. I'm not going to play it now, but you're, you're encouraged to take a look. This was a tweet with an embedded video. It says, Gramdad Squarepants talks about his life under the sea. And yes, of course, he lived in a pineapple and he worked at uh, you know, worked making flipping burgers and had a co-worker named Squidward and lived with a with Patrick and it was a very close relationship and at any rate it's worth a listen it's very entertaining works on many levels including under the sea which makes you think of the little mermaid but I'll move on I put in this picture that I've seen before but it was in a couple of different tweets I saw this week these are two perfectly geometrical circles and I still can't believe it 
I mean, you could trace them around if you want and see there's one and there's one all the way around and it still doesn't look right, you know? It's amazing how bad that one messes with your brain. So I just put in, no, they're not, but of course they are. This tweet I put labeled as oops, and it said, but then something happened the ring did not intend. It was picked up by the most unlikely creature imaginable. For some reason, the image didn't come through, so I have to go to Twitter here, and you see there's the picture with this somewhat translucent fish wearing what is arguably the one ring. And wow, yeah, I imagine the ring did not intend that. And that fish is going to be very surprised when the Nazgul show up. Black Riders, etc. Under the section called That Was Awesome, I had something about the World Baseball Classic. Now, I didn't watch much of it. In fact, I just kind of lucked into pieces here and there. It was hard enough to find on any channel on television. But when I heard that there was a chance that in the finals, Japan against the U.S., that Shohei Otani was going to come in and pitch the ninth with a one-run lead and very likely the third player to bat was going to be Mike Trout, I had to watch that. I mean, oh my goodness. Uh, arguably, Trout is arguably one of the, maybe the best player ever. And Otani is doing things that no one has ever done, being both a great hitter and a great pitcher which most people, most of the people I respect as baseball analysts and stuff, thought was simply impossible. And he's doing those things on a regular basis. He already had a phenomenal World Baseball Classic as a hitter and a pitcher, and here he's going to come in to pitch. And they did. It came down to, uh, he, see, he gave up a, a, a single, or, or was it a walk? I think he gave up a walk on a very close pitch and then got a grounder for a double play. So there were two outs in the bottom of the ninth with a one-run lead, and here comes Mike Trout. And the thing went full count. I mean, it was six pitch inning. It was amazing. Or six pitch uh, at bat. And Otani threw two incredible fastballs, 100 mile an hour plus. Like if you could see it, go ahead and hit it. You know, <laughs> just amazing. And Trout took a couple of titanic swings. If he connected, that we never would have found that ball again. It would have burned up on reentry. But managed to, didn't hit either one of them. And then on a three and two pitch, Ochani throws this wicked 87 mile per hour slider that I say finished off the plate, but it was really close. And Trout was swinging at it, but he couldn't quite get it to foul it off. And that was strike three. And it was just beautiful. I mean, you couldn't root against or either of them. They were just wonderful to see something like that. It was so great. So at any rate, I just thought I'd include it in here. I, I had a great time watching that. Two of the greatest players ever going right at it. And I'm very happy for all concerned, actually. This image here and their little dog, too, was medieval Scooby-Doo, if you could see. it's And I'm, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the old English here. Uh, and ich would, well, God, I can't. Uh, and it basically says, and I would have gotten away with it, were it not for the meddling youthen, right? The meddling kids and their dog too, of course. Oh, I clicked and you could see a little bit bigger here. Any rate, that I thought was very clever. Medieval Twitter, or medieval Scooby. I guess. Uh, this Venn diagram, if you know, you know. So it's got a Venn diagram of therapy and BDSM and Dungeons and Dragons. And boy, there's three you don't expect to see together. And therapy and Dungeons and Dragons overlap at scheduling conflicts, and therapy and BDSM overlap at that's good, cry if you need to. And BDSM and Dungeons and Dragons overlap at shortage of good dungeon masters. And the center, of course, is good session. Yeah. Okay, so I thought that was clever, and I have a few friends who will appreciate it. Looks reasonable, or so I hear. This next one I labeled, as you say, you want a revolution. I love this. Uh, this was a, on Mastodon. Toot said, the Borg queen on Star Trek implies the existence of a middle class of Borg, the Borg choisie. Yeah. Hard to resist that logic. Borg choisie. I have got to find somewhere to use that gag. That's just phenomenal. And I'm sure there's follow-ons to it. I just couldn't think of any anytime soon, but boy, that was good. 
Uh, speaking of logic, this one, picture worth a thousand words, is Spock holding up a Vulcan salute. And the caption says, don't play with super glue. And unfortunately, it's labeled Dr. Spock, when in reality, we all know it's, you know, Mr. or Commander, however you want to say it, you know, uh, but it's not Doctor. Now, again, I don't want to object to his knowledge. Obviously, Spock would have the equivalent knowledge of any number of doctorates that he'd need for the episodes. You know, it moved at the speed of plot, as they say. Um, but the problem is, is that there is a Dr. Spock, at least in my generation, there was. The Dr. Spock that I linked to here is was Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote a book about advice for parents about uh, child raising. If I open up the link here, you'll see um, Baby and Child Care, and it was a best-selling book, the, you know, huge bestseller, and a lot of people attributed kids' bad behavior to parents listening to Dr. Spock. So at the time, of course, Star Trek was a 60s thing as well. The original Spock here, well, Dr. Spock was much earlier than that, but still there's a, an overlap. And I didn't like it when they used Doctor here. I was going to go ahead and try to fix the image. And I thought, eh, it's a little more work than I intended. And it's still a good gag regardless. So have a great week, everybody. Uh, as a reminder, all the upcoming training classes on the O'Reilly Learning Platform are at the, this link and all the upcoming No Fluff Just Stuff virtual workshops are here. The O'Reilly link is for me specifically. The other link is for all the virtual workshops at No Fluff. This week, I've got week three of my Spring and Spring Boot in Three Weeks course on the O'Reilly Learning Platform. And fascinatingly enough, as a teaser, the, the long-delayed, long-awaited return of the Groovy Podcast will be back with good old Graham Roche himself, where I've been trying to arrange that, or others have, and me, for a long time. And it's just, he's a really busy guy. So, at any rate, it'll be mostly about things related to Micronaut, but we'll see what else we can get into. So that's the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that. That's the podcast. That's the newsletter. If you do enjoy this, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I hope again that I will see you all next week. Thank you very much.